Hello and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. I receive your phone calls and I love to hear from you by email as well. I love those calls and I love hearing from Canada and all over America. It's great to do a show for you. On today's program, a very special exclusive interview with Dr. David Sampson. Who is he? He's a very important person that I hope you will get to know better on today's show. He is the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development, and he answers to President Bush. His job is to improve the economy in depressed parts of America. And on today's program, we'll see his impression of Alaska. <laughs> Traditional living, hunting, and fishing. There are communities here that are older than America, older than its constitution, older than its government. these communities find themselves competing in a global marketplace. And now that same government is trying to help community leaders change the economy of rural Alaska. It's a job as big and as unique as the state itself. Flying around rural Alaska, it's easy to find the mistakes of the past. In Unalakleet, a village on the Bering Sea south of Nome, the government is paying the Bering Straits Native Corporation to pick up thousands of old fuel barrels. Tim Tawarik is the president and CEO of that corporation. Well, the barrels were brought here back in the 50s when uh, the Air Force came in. So they brought a year's supply of fuel, or at least a year's supply of fuel, to uh, build the roads and build a site. So they, they brought in thousands of barrels. When the military pulled out of Unalakleet, the barrels were stacked near the village, waiting to be loaded onto a barge that never came. Then, in 1973, a flood scattered the barrels for miles around the village. The IRA Council has been working for years trying to get the, the federal government, the Department of Defense, to come in and clean up the sites and the barrels, and uh, that's, this is the result of it. Government officials often find themselves making decisions about rural Alaska from thousands of miles away. Regulations made to fit the rest of the country often don't fit into village life. St. George Island is a few square miles of land surrounded by the vastness of the Bering Sea. Peter Lekhanov lives on the island and brings home a little money by commercial fishing. He sees the hardships of Alaska's economy in the faces of its youth. That's one of the reasons why a lot of the high school kids nowadays, after they graduate, they move off island because there's nothing here for them. It's sad to say. To say Alaska's economy is unique is a gross understatement. Unlike most states, it's an economy based on the abundance of the land and sea. Oil, tourism, and fishing are the biggest money makers in the state. I'm going to get the price on this here. 
And it only takes a visit to any grocery store in rural Alaska to understand how the high cost of shipping affects the economy. A gallon of milk at the Hondor store in Galena currently costs about $8, while in Chicago it costs $3. Those additional costs not only make your breakfast more expensive, they also make it harder for companies to compete in the global economy. Then I went uh, to seminary and uh, uh, received advanced degrees in, in theology and was uh, an ordained minister for uh, many years. This and, is Dr. Uh, David Samson. He is the U.S. Uh, Assistant uh, Secretary of Commerce uh, for Economic uh, Development uh, under economic President Bush. I was Simply put, uh, so his job is to develop the economy yesterday. across America. I, uh, I he recently visited three yeah, villages in rural Alaska uh, to learn firsthand how living and working in our part of the country is just a little different than anywhere else. Jeff Stacer is a federal co-chair of the Denali Commission. He talks about some of the changes he's noticed since Dr. Samson took over the Economic Development Agency. He is stepping forward and saying the Economic Development Agency is accountable. We need to get federal government working together and focus on these challenges. Now, we can't do it alone. The communities and states and regions have to do their part. Uh, the first thing I'm here to do is to listen and learn about the challenges that they have, uh, to find out the kinds of things that the federal government is doing uh, that put barriers in the way of growth so that we can go back and work on reducing uh, those barriers and eliminating many of those barriers. Um, and, uh, and so we do care. The Economic Development Administration, or EDA, was created in 1965 to help create jobs in depressed parts of America. The idea is for the government to use its leverage to encourage private enterprise and local people to create business, business that creates jobs, and jobs bring communities out of economic distress. The president believes very strongly that no geographic area or demographic sector of America should be left behind when it comes to having the chance to participate more fully in the American dream and economic opportunity. The American dream in the villages is defined in a different way. And looking around the vastness that surrounds many villages, it's hard to find economic opportunity. As you can see, when you look around here, uh, there's not much of an, uh, a cash flow or economic base. There's no Walmart here. There isn't any, uh, um, any kind of businesses. So the cash economy is very low. Um, what the, most of our villages have had to do is basically survive on two different economies, which is one is the, which is the, uh, of course, the cash economy, and the, the major portion of it is the subsistence. Henry Rexford works with the youth of the Bering Straits region. This isn't the first time I have been here. He knows firsthand the problems these youth will face as they grow into community leaders. This is where the, uh, the youth councils come in. At least um, they can voice their concerns and hopefully try to partner with the, the rest of the community. It's going to take a lot of community partnership uh, to make this work, but basically give that voice to the to the leaders of these communities and to see how we can start uh, actually developing more jobs. It might be in entrepreneuring. It might be actually taking some of the, uh, the things that they have that are very natural, like the resources. Um, of course, we've got um, our native dancing. We've got a lot of our arts and crafts. Um, now, all we have to do is to start trying to develop some ways of actually getting it to the market. We have to start thinking about um, well, what other kind of opportunities, job opportunities, can we create at the local level? Uh, we're not going to be developing jobs and fixing airports forever. We have to go beyond. Um, we're not interested any longer in just processing grants and getting money out the door. Uh, what we're interested in is results and making sure that uh, federal economic development grants actually increase uh, job opportunities for uh, the citizens uh, around the country.
guess I'm a fisherman. I've been a fisherman all my life. Tell me about Fish, it. Been fishing since I was uh, eight years old. I'm now 42. Looks like my fishing career is about to be ended. This is Leonard Holmberg Sr. He knows all too well the need to shore up the economy of rural Alaska. With the fishing industry faltering all over the state, there are more than just jobs at stake. There are families. They can't rely on fishing anymore. They've got to get a different job, have other opportunities to go to. It's like me and my dad, and stuff, we uh, depend on this all our life. Now it's, there's no more. There are many reasons for the very low fish prices across the state, but whatever the reason, the effects will be felt in communities like Sand Point. We really don't know what's going to happen in communities that way because they really rely on fish tax. That's what runs the city. All the fish tax. We don't know what's going to happen. With whole communities on the brink of collapsing, just like salmon prices, Dr. Sampson really has some challenges before him. The new clinic building in Unalakleet is really starting to take shape. Unalakleet is one of the villages that Dr. Sampson was able to visit on his tour of Alaska. I, I, I was there to, uh, to view the sub-regional primary care clinic that the Denali Commission is helping to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to fund. Uh, I saw the, the pride that the community takes in the development of that facility that's going to serve a number of villages uh, in that uh, region. Uh, but perhaps even more important was the, uh, the, the construction crew made up of uh, residents uh, of that uh, village that are, that are building a very sophisticated building and, uh, and learning skills that they are going to be able to use in other construction projects uh, in the area. And, and that regional facility is going to increase the demand uh, for medical uh, personnel. Uh, and, and, and we need to be looking for strategies to make sure that uh, uh, Alaskans are filling Alaska jobs. One way that is happening is through collaboration. Once again, Jeff Stacer of the Denali Commission. It's that, that word collaboration, it's so interesting. If you write it down, in the middle of it, there's another word, and it's called labor. And what that means is work together. In fact, uh, we don't build things unless we're invited into the community. They have a plan of how they want the, the community to progress that they agree to. And we're just there to help the community help themselves. And One community that knows how to help itself is Galena. Galena is home to one of the longest runways in the bush. It was built by the Air Force during World War II. Both the runway and Air Force base attached to it were put into warm storage in 1993. Galena is also one of the villages Dr. Sampson visited. I don't know how anyone could uh, visit, uh, let's say, Galena, uh, for example and see the way the uh, community there has worked with uh, uh, the Air Force uh, to reuse that base and many of the facilities on that base, the expansion of the, uh, the health care healthcare facility uh, there, uh, the, um, uh, the dormitories, the school, the, the uh, residential school for uh, high school students around uh, Alaska, that they have a very cohesive a uh, group of leaders among the various organizations of the village corporation, the tribal uh, organization. The kind of planning Dr. Sampson is talking about mm. isn't complicated. As a matter of fact, it has a lot to do with breakfast. Right here in Green, I'll say one thing to these people that every month, sometimes twice a month, they go up here to one of these restaurants from 30, 40 of them get there, have breakfast, have a breakfast meeting, and planning what we should be doing down the road three, four, five, and ten years from now. Sidney Huntington lived in Galena almost all his life. He's seen the community grow, and despite his age, he's still excited about the future. I've heard some good plans of what's going to happen there in the next few years, maybe. 
You have to plan ahead. Be prepared for whatever, if and the dollar ever comes up again. Sidney Huntington uh, in uh, Galena is a, a man who has a, a fascinating uh, life story. Uh, and uh, it was kind of like meeting a legend to be able to uh, visit with him. Uh, I think that uh, he really exemplifies this, uh, this perspective that uh, Alaskans want to be self-sufficient. Uh, they don't want to uh, uh, just live with the transfer payments from uh, federal and state uh, agencies. And uh, I think he's a very articulate spokesman for an economic development strategy that will bring new sources of income into communities. And uh, it was a fascinating experience getting to meet him. Dr. Sampson has a simple philosophy of economic development. It has to do with what he calls the three L's. What we've talked about uh, in, in the villages is that our uh, mission at the Department of Commerce and EDA is, first of all, to link link communities together in a comprehensive economic development strategy mm -hmm. and link them with the appropriate uh, resources at the state and federal level. Secondly, the second L is leverage. Uh, our goal is to you know, leverage the private sector investment. Ultimately, government can't create wealth. Government can only create the conditions in which the private sector will invest money and create jobs. And so what we want to do is to try to leverage maximum private sector investment. And then third, learn. Uh, there are, uh, I think there are some very um, uh, forward-looking, uh, progressive uh, communities uh, that are around uh, Alaska that we had the opportunity to visit. Uh, they have, they've identified a strategy, they've proven a concept, and what we need to be able to do is to help other uh, communities learn from them and then replicate uh, those strategies. It would be almost impossible to visit rural Alaska and not leave with lasting impressions. And Dr. Sampson will take what he's learned back to Washington. I think of the faces of, of uh, the children that I met uh, in uh, Kotlik, uh, the beautiful little girls that were there, uh, uh, Veronica, I, I remember Veronica very, very clearly, and, and uh, you know, the bright face uh, and, and the smile that, uh, that greeted us there. Um, I, I want to stay focused on creating opportunity uh, for her. Uh, I assure you, uh, I, will, I will not uh, forget uh, walking through those uh, walking on the boardwalk uh, in uh, Kotlik uh, as we make uh, economic uh, policy decisions back in Washington. Those folks will be uh, very much on the, on the front of my mind. subject of the economy in Alaska. Let's travel out to the Pribilof Islands to St. George. The economy there is not so good, but at least their clinic has some new improvements. rugged beauty, an island of mist, a home to countless birds from all over the world. Hundreds of miles out in the Bering Sea, St. George Island is one of the most remote places on the planet. But for about 150 people, it is the only place they'll call home. Healthcare in such a remote place is not easy. What would be a minor problem in a big city can become an emergency out here. Well, um, right here is one of our exam rooms, exam room one. Georgia Cachavera works hard to keep the small clinic on St. George up to date and staffed. But it's not easy to recruit qualified people from so far away. 
we have been seeking the past two years for a full-time PA physician assistant, and um, and we're still trying to secure, if not a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, or RN, registered nurse uh, to cover our clinic, and it's been pretty hard. St. George is an old village full of quaint old buildings, but there's nothing quaint about outdated and run-down medical equipment. As you see, this is an old x-ray machine, and it has a ten tendency to short out. The St. George Traditional Council raised $470,000 for new equipment in their clinic, but they needed a little more. With such a clear need, public support in the community and a traditional council ready to support the clinic, the Denali Commission saw a great opportunity to help. Through a program called Fast Track, the commission was able to get $57,000 to the clinic in a very short time. We're getting a new um, oxygen filtration system because we have to send out our oxygen bottles and that costs a lot of money. Fast Track allows projects with a good plan and strong community involvement get their funding in a matter of months rather than years. We'll be also getting a new uh, stretcher with an IV pole attached to it. It was a little help at just the right time for an island that is working hard to make their corner of the world a little brighter. Thank you so much, Jeff Stacer from the Denali Commission and others involved with those other stories about the Denali Commission and their work around Alaska. And thank you, Dr. Sampson. It was a pleasure meeting you. And it's a pleasure bringing Heartbeat Alaska to you. And I want to thank you once again for joining us. Join me again next week for more news that touches the lives of our Native people. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless you. We'll see you then. Here we fish from maybe about a quarter, quarter mile offshore to maybe four or five miles offshore. Peter Lekinoff is a commercial fisherman on St. George Island. He doesn't have to look far to find the problems with the state's economy. That's one of the reasons why a lot of the high school kids nowadays, after they graduate, they move off island because there's nothing here for them. It's sad to say. Uh, the, the citizen of the most remote village in Alaska is just as much an American citizen as that uh, a person who is unemployed in New York City as a result of the terrorist attack. This is Dr. David Sampson. He is the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic and, uh, Development under mandate, President Bush. Well, Simply put, I, uh, his I job is to develop Jeff the economy that, uh, across America. He recently visited three villages in rural uh, Alaska to learn firsthand how living and working in our part of the country is just a little different than anywhere else. Uh, our goal is to you know, leverage the private sector investment. Ultimately, government can't create wealth. Government can only create the conditions in which the private sector will invest money and create jobs. Dr. Sampson blames some of Alaska's economic woes on federal environmental regulations. Quite honestly, there are a number of uh, federal policies uh, that have been developed over the last decade 
uh, that have really disrupted and dislocated regional economies uh, within Alaska. Uh, policies having to do with uh, the use of uh, resources. The Bush administration wants to develop more of Alaska's natural resources, including timber, and they believe they could do it responsibly. We believe that uh, uh, that sustainable development uh, is, is possible, that uh, uh, the economic use of natural resources is not inconsistent uh, and contradictory to a sound economic uh, or environmental use of uh, natural resources. Dr. Sampson pledged to remember what he learned in rural Alaska as he makes policy decisions. He is planning to visit us again. For KNBA Radio, I'm Jeannie Green.